Kelsey. Uh, I would like to start off by saying that uh, I'm currently on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish nations. Now, um, yeah, thank you for the warm welcome. So to introduce myself a little more, uh, yeah, just like she said, I'm a financial educator who empowers people to maximize their financial resources to actually enable them to make their own choices. Now, a little bit about myself. Um, I have a background in carpentry, which I did for, uh, I mean, maybe four or five years, and then more recently engineering as well. And so those are, you know, two kind of totally different worlds from the world of finance. And so how I actually got introduced into finance in the first place was actually with an education system. Now, part of that education I'm going to be sharing with you today. Uh, we don't really have time to go through all of it, but hopefully we can get through enough in 45 minutes to, uh, to, to help you with some practical, uh, you know, decisions or advice and help you actually apply this in your own life. So essentially our firm carries out all of this education over Zoom at no expense. So I'll say if anybody would like to learn more after this session and maybe how you could apply it even more into your own life, then I'll leave my email in the chat box and I'd absolutely love to hear from you. Now, a question I often get asked is why am I actually taking the time to teach this financial education? And I'd like to, well, usually I would answer, uh, ask one of you a question, but actually maybe if somebody could just answer in the chat. So what's the first place that most people think of when it comes to receiving financial education, or sorry, financial services? Oh, I see chat box over here, the bank. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, um, my chat box is on the other side of the screen there. So yeah, absolutely, I would agree, it's the bank as well. But here's the thing, that's supposed to be a B. When it comes to the banking system in Canada, there are two very, very distinct sides to it. On the one hand, we have branch level banking, right? Now, this is what most of us are familiar with. You might walk into the TD, into the BMO down the street, and there would be tellers, advisors, and managers. But what we always say is that the two areas of life that people care the most about and pay the most attention to is our health and our wealth. Now, when it comes to individuals who have specialized in the health department, like a doctor, a surgeon, etc., these individuals have gone to school for usually eight to 12 years, and they get paid very, very well as a result, usually anywhere from 150 to $400,000 a year. Now, why am I actually bringing up how much they get paid? It's because when we looked at industry average earnings amongst branch level individuals, it's generally around 17 to $25 an hour. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with that, right? They're perfectly respectable individuals, and I'm sure they work very, very hard. But I would just like you all to ask yourselves, does it make sense for somebody specialized in the wealth department to be making that level of compensation? The answer is, well, not likely. So then we realize that these individuals aren't often actually specialized in the wealth department, but they are providing advice to 95% of Canadians. And this is why the attention to detail, the proper education have never been given to most people. Now, I'm sure you all might be wondering, right? What about the other 5%? Well, these are the ultra wealthy. And generally they have millions and millions of dollars in the bank, and when they walk you know, into the bank, they might go to the fancy one downtown, up to the third, the fifth, maybe the 20th floor, where they get to deal with certified financial advisors. And this is known as private level banking. Now, these advisors provide them with custom education and custom strategies and generally make anywhere from $180,000 to $300,000 a year. So right there, we see that these individuals in the private level are much more representative of being specialized in the wealth department. So my goal with this education is to provide the private level of education to 100% of Canadians. Because I honestly believe whether somebody's making 500 or $5 million worth of income, everyone deserves to receive the same level of education to make the best decisions for themselves and for their family as well. Now, essentially two main reasons why I'm doing this on uh, well, on a personal or on a business side, number one, 95% of Canadians, I'm sure you all can imagine that this is a huge market, right? 
And at the end of the day, after somebody has gone through our education sessions, I want them to be so knowledgeable about their own finances that whatever product or strategy they choose to take on in order to uh, accomplish their financial goals, that they can defend it in the real world and win that conversation out there. So this is what I mean by empowering people when it comes to their finances. And the second reason why we're doing this is um, I'm sure anybody who's uh, you know paying attention to the news or the stock market knows that we are in a financial crash right now, right? But honestly, the stock market has crashed before and then it's gone up, it's you know crashed again, and it's probably gonna go up again after that. I honestly think that most problems when it comes to the financials of anyone are simply due to a lack of education. So this is why we're actually taking the time to teach this financial education. Now, what are a couple problems that individuals are actually facing when it comes to finance right now? Number one, we have low interest savings and high interest debts. Now, I would usually ask what, uh, what an individual, who, who they actually bank with, I'll go with myself. So I personally bank with Scotiabank. And if I were to walk in a Scotiabank right now and open up a savings account, they would generally give me maybe around 0.05 to around 1% interest. So really nothing to, uh, to phone home about. I mean, I've seen banks also advertise like getting 1.3% 1 1 interest on a GIC. So, you know, obviously 0.05 to 1% is not even enough to keep up with inflation right now. But what if we walk in the same bank and open up a credit card? Well, the interest that they would charge us on this is anywhere from 19.9 to around 21%. So they're taking my money, giving me half a percent on it, and then loaning it back to me for what, 20%? Now, you know, obviously the system is legal and they make a whole lot of money doing it. But my point is that this system is hurting a lot of Canadians who are trying to build wealth. So one of the first things we want to do for people is show them how to increase interest that they receive on savings and decrease interest that they're paying on their debts. And as an example, some of our clients with this over the last couple of years have been able to earn anywhere from 10, 20, even 30% compound interest on their money year after year. And we've also had clients with over $10,000 in credit card debt paying that 20% and able to turn it into just 6%. So these are some of the ways that we're able to help people. Now, unfortunately, according to compliance rules, I'm not actually able to share any very, very specific uh, in investment advice with anybody in, this, uh, in a group setting here. But once again, I'll leave my email in there if anybody would like to chat further, or hopefully this education can benefit you wherever you're at. Now, some people may ask, well, why does it even matter if my money grows more? And as I kind of mentioned earlier, it's because of inflation. Oh, see a comment in there? All right. Um, I, uh, I, I, think that's a, I think that's a good thing. So thank you, Daniel. Um, so yes, inflation. Now inflation in Canada wide right now, it's around seven to eight percent, right? I think it might even be higher than that. It might be around 8.5 or something absolutely ridiculous, right? Usually the Bank of Canada, they aim for around two to three percent. Um, yeah, it could, could very, very well go higher than this. And hey, even if we got what the Bank of Canada is aiming for, and our money is growing by half a percent, everything's still getting more expensive by two to three percent. So clearly, we're not actually making money when we're holding it inside the savings account. Um, so at the very least, we want to learn how to grow our money, just so that we don't have to fall into this trap of inflation, and where we are losing purchasing power. So that's the first reason that, I mean, sorry, the first problem and the way that we can actually help individuals is by teaching them about growing their money. Now, second problem that a lot of individuals are facing right now is retirement. Now, I'm sure some people have noticed that it seems like older and older individuals are still working today. And sometimes I find myself wondering, or well, I used to, I would say, why, are, why does it seem like older and older people are still working? And I think the answer obviously is that, hey, maybe they don't have enough saved up right at this moment. And I think that there's a deeper reason behind that as well. I think it's because back in the day, 
the Canadian pension plan was actually very, very good. And it was able to take care of an individual's needs on a monthly basis. But what's happened over the years is that the CPP has gone down and down, right? Now, if you look at your paycheck, you'll see that about 4.95% of it is going to pay off the CPP, or sorry, going towards the CPP. Now, uh, I used to think that, hey, maybe this money is going to uh, into some kind of account that I'm going to be able to access someday and uh, you know my retirement will be set. But what it's actually going to do is pay off the current retirees today. And I'm not sure if anybody here knows what the maximum amount of money that we could get from the CPP currently on a monthly basis. Um, it's actually around $1,200 a month. And that's only if you've worked in Canada for 40 years. Now, of course, the average individual hasn't done that. So the average CPP payout currently is around $650 a month. Now, I mean, I know this is Canada wide, but I don't care where you are in Canada, $650 a month or even $1,200 is not going to get very far, right? With current gas prices, maybe that's a couple tanks of gas, a couple trips to the grocery store, right? Just like Charles is saying, inflation is continuing to rise. Now, why is this actually happening? Well, back in the day, the government, or sorry, back in the day, for every one person that was retiring, there were six people still paying into that CPP. So that one person was able to enjoy a pretty good retirement. But what's happened over the years, now for every single person that's retiring, there are only about three people paying into that CPP. And for a couple of reasons, right? People are living longer, baby boomers are retiring, and people are having less kids as well. Um, and also, of course, the government of Canada, they know that this is a problem. And they actually knew that this was going to be a problem back in the. Yeah, I guess that would be true as well, Charles. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in the government of Canada, what they did back in the 1950s, they introduced an account called the RRSP. And they said, all right, if you guys can save for your own retirement, we're going to take less tax from you in order to motivate you. But it wasn't enough. 60 years later, 2009, they introduced the TFSA and they said, all right, please, please save for your own retirement. Don't rely on us and you can keep all of that growth totally tax-free. But I say that to say this, maybe there's some people in this call who, uh, who play an instrument. I myself don't, I uh, you know, uh, kind of regret, I never took the time to learn as a kid or in high school. Maybe there's still time, but honestly, if you give me a, uh, a guitar right now, then I'm not gonna make a very good sound with it. Right? It'll probably, I don't know, maybe I'll break, break a string, some kids might cry, might break some glass, who knows. But if I give one of you who is trained with a guitar and you're much more knowledgeable and more experienced in terms of using that instrument, then you are probably going to make a pretty beautiful sound with that guitar. And these accounts are the exact same thing. And honestly, I don't want to sound too, uh, you know, too infomercial here, but the potential inside these accounts is huge, right? You can even compare it to a Ferrari. But if we want to get to our destination, we got to take that Ferrari out of the school zone, put it on the highway, and take off the brakes. So this is the second way that we want to help people with this education, is teach them how they best can use these individual accounts. And I'll be covering a little bit of this today. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze as much in as possible, depending on how much time we have. Now, Third and final issue that a lot of Canadians, well not final, but third issue I'm going to talk about here that a lot of Canadians are facing regarding their finances is unexpected events. Now, a, a very, very close friend of mine who works at our downtown office, uh, I'm sorry, I, I live in Vancouver and he works at our office downtown with me. He's a close friend and a colleague and he was actually a professional boxer in Amsterdam for a number of years. And while he was there, he also owned a couple of businesses and he was doing, you know, obviously very well for himself while he was there. When he moved back to Vancouver, back to Canada, within, I think, six months of that happening, he actually suffered a major stroke. And so I'm very, very grateful to be working with him now that he's able to, to walk and to talk and, and um, that he was able to recover. But over that time when it took him to recover, obviously he wasn't able to work and he ran through all of his savings in you know, a four to six month time frame. So I guess my point with all this 
is that in order to reach financial independence, there are a few simple steps that we need to follow. Um, and hopefully you can read my, uh, my writing there. Number one, we need to save our money and put a little bit away every time we get paid and pay ourselves into our future. You know, so essentially if you're a business owner, then you get money from your business, pay yourself into your future, into your kid's future, into your community's future as well. Or if you're an employee, get paid by your boss and pay yourself in your future. Number two, we need to learn how to grow our money and at the very least to outpace inflation. Now, hopefully we can do much, much more than that. And like I said, I can't unfortunately share any very specific investment strategies um, on a call with, in, in a group call because compliance doesn't actually allow. Now, number three, of course, we want that growth to be in our pockets and not in the government pockets. So we want to be tax efficient with that growth. And finally, fourth step to building wealth, just in case anything happens that's outside of our control, we don't want all of our hard work in these first three steps to go to waste. So we want to protect this wealth. And in time, if we follow these four steps, then we say that we can indeed build wealth. Now, here, I don't mean that all of us become billionaires, right? I'm sure some people may have those kind of ambitions, but what I mean is that, let's say at the age of 65, if an individual has a million dollars saved up over that time, then that million dollars, let's say you can get 5% growth on it every single year. At 5%, that's already $50,000 of potentially tax-free retirement income. And of course, by using just this 50,000, we're not touching on any of the 1 million, which, I mean, this can you know, go towards family, to community as well. So all of it can end up going back to the people that we love. And I guess that makes my job very, very simple. Then. It's just to show people how they can get to this million dollar number. Honestly, it's not a get rich quick scheme, right? It doesn't uh, necessarily have to do with, <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't have to do with uh, crypto, lottery, et cetera. I mean, hey, I have no problem with either of those things. I just think that we should have a concrete plan, learn how to educate ourselves, and in time, we can get to these numbers. I mean, they may seem very, very far away for some individuals or for a lot of people, but honestly, with growth over time, I'm going to show you in just a minute here, but the power of compound growth is very, very real. Now, the first thing I want to talk to you about in, uh, in, re in regards to actually building wealth, following these four steps, was what was the first step? It was to save our money. Now, when it comes to saving our money, essentially the point of it is building net. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard of this concept or know how it's calculated. Excuse me, but just to share how net worth is actually calculated, it is everything you own minus everything that you owe. Or in other words, it is all of your assets minus all of your liabilities. And why am I actually talking about this? Well, when it comes to the financials of anyone in the country and culture that we live in, net worth is the most important concept because this is how the banks and institutions rank us and an individual can only ever retire if they have a high enough net worth. I mean, let's go back to the CPP example. Unless we want to live, I mean, I mean living on obviously $1,200 a month isn't really ideal in today's economy in the way that, you know, things are headed. So with a high enough net worth, that's actually going to determine our retirement age. Now, when it comes to building net worth, we say that there are two types of individuals in this world. Number one, we have survivors. And on the other hand, we have drivers. So what's the difference between the two? Well, they could honestly be almost the exact same individual. And survivors, what they do, they go to work and they get their paycheck, right? And then with their paycheck, they pay their living expenses, they pay their taxes, and they pay their debts as well. And essentially, survivors are living day by day, week by week, month by month, paycheck to paycheck. Now, essentially, they're just surviving through their financials. So how do we make the switch from survivors to thrivers? What is it that could actually make a change? 
Well, it doesn't mean that we have to go and you know make a whole lot more money. It doesn't mean we have to cut all of our spending in half. But the difference between a survivor and a thriver is nothing but a mindset. It is a mentality shift. And like I said, it could be the exact same individual. They could be making the same amount of money, paying the same expenses, paying the same taxes, and even paying the same debts. So then the mindset difference is actually a save first mentality. So thrivers understand that in order to build their net worth, they need to put a little bit away, whether it's $5, $500, or $5,000 every single time that they get paid and pay themselves into their future. And by doing this and by building our net worth, not only will we be able to service ourselves better in retirement, but also our kids, our grandkids, our communities, families, all of that will be helped by this thriver mentality. Now, survivors on the other end also often have a spend first mentality. And I'm sure we all know, right, after we get our paycheck, if we spend that money on expenses, taxes, and debts, honestly, there's usually a whole not, uh, there's not a whole lot left over at the end of the month to go into saving. So essentially, you know, it, it kind of takes up whatever space that we tend to give it. So when we talk about the four steps to building wealth, we, now we know that saving money is nothing but a mindset. And I don't really cover budgeting in any of this education. You know, there are lots of resources for that online for anybody interested to see where, hey, maybe they could save a couple bucks and pay themselves into the future and really develop that thriver mentality. Um, now to move on here, just to touch very, very quickly and briefly on the growth aspect. Again, I don't have uh, so much time here, but to talk about growth, essentially, I want to talk about the two different types of interest that we can actually get on our money. So remember I said that, hey, the bank is going to offer you maybe, maybe, you know, 1.5, maybe 2%. Now, the two types of growth that we can get on our money, how could we actually grow our money better than what the bank is just giving us? Well, there are two types. Essentially, there is simple interest and there is compound interest. Now, what are the differences between the two? Well, let's say an individual comes to me and says, hey, Levi, I have $10,000 that I want to invest. I don't know, maybe his name is Joe. Joe says, Levi, I got $10,000 that I want to invest. And I want to get 10% on my money every single year. Well, I say, all right, Joe, if you get simple interest on your money, you're only ever going to get 10% on the original $10,000. So after the first year, he has... 11,000, 12, and then 13, so on and so forth. What does our friend Joe have, that have after 21 years? He would have 31,000. So essentially, that's 21 times the 1,000 plus the original $10,000. So, hey, not bad. He tripled his money over 20 years, but maybe there's a little better growth that Joe could have gotten. Now, if he wanted even better growth, maybe you could go with compound interest. And I say, hey, Joe, with compound interest, you always get 10% on whatever the previous year had actually given you. So after one year, you would have what? 11,000 once again. But 10% of 11,000 is now 1.1,000. So after the second year, he has 12.1,000. And I'm sure you all can imagine this is going to get pretty hard to calculate, right? And of course, I'm not going to, you know, go through every single of the 21 years because our friend Einstein actually came up with the rule called the rule of 72. And what did Albert Einstein say? Well, he said, hey, if you divide 72 by the amount of interest that you're getting, that gives you the number of years that it takes for your money to actually double. Are you with me? So after seven years, our friend Joe would now have 20,000. After 14 years, our friend Joe would now have 40,000. And in the 21st year, our friend Joe would have $80,000. Now, as you can see, there's clearly a huge, huge difference on simple and compound interest. So, I mean, I don't have to ask, but you know, maybe I will. Uh, what would we rather be getting on our savings 
obviously we want compound interest, right? But if we have debts, would we be rather paying simple interest or compound interest on that debt? Well, we want it to grow less because you know, it's money that we owe. So we would rather be paying simple interest. But here's the thing is that for most Canadians, these two are actually switched. So if you go to the bank and open up a savings account or a GIC, which which banks offer as well, then that is going to be simple interest on your money. But hey, if we ever take out a mortgage, any kind of car loan, any kind of financing line of credit, that's gonna be compound interest that they're charging us. So how can we actually earn compound interest on our money then? Well, once again, I wish that I could go into more detail, but I'll just say a few different ways that we can actually achieve this compound growth. Number one, we have stocks number two we have bonds number three we have something called a money market investment number four we have real estate number five we have something called a mutual fund and then as well beyond this there are things like crypto and commodities as well and I'm not so well versed in those, but these are essentially the five main ways that you can earn compound growth on your money. So if somebody is looking to research more, then, I mean, all of these five are a great place to start and just look into what these investment options actually could be. Um, and yeah, so that's essentially the five ways that we can actually compound our money. Now, one more thing that I want to show you all here is the tax efficiency and actually the indigenous strategies part of parts of this. So tax efficiency for First Nations. Well, I'm sure many in here might earn tax exempt income. You know, if like, and if you have a, a property, that property might be exempt from property tax as well. So then you might be wondering, well, why would I need tax efficiency strategies, right? It's not like I'm paying any tax already on either my property or my income. But here's the thing. Sure, that is tax-free and that is great. It allows you to save more. It allows you to, well, you know, of course, pay less tax and you know, do with that money instead of going straight towards the government. But when it comes to growing our money, it's not always tax-free. And here's what I mean. I'm not, well, I'm not an accountant myself, so don't take me word for word on this, but I will say that unless you're investing into a bank or some business that is on a reserve, and if that bank is also investing your money within a reserve in Canada, only then will that growth be tax free. However, if we use that kind of growth, then that would realistically be some kind of uh, very, very low interest option at a bank. The tax-free kinds of investments that we could get from banks um, through the Indian Act would be growing by, I mean, not to, I wouldn't say, don't quote me on this exactly, but maybe a want around 1.3 to 3%, roughly. So as we can see, inflation is you know, double this right now. And like I said, there are actually ways that we can achieve much more and much more and much better growth on our money. So how could we actually keep this growth tax-free without investing at such low rates? Well, we could use a TFSA. And just like I was mentioning before, this is the tax-free savings account that the government of Canada introduced so that we can save on taxes and be able to save more money. Now, using the TFSA, essentially all of our growth inside this account is tax sheltered, which means that we get to keep all of it. And when we access the money in the future, it is tax free as well. So this is a very, very good investment option for honestly anybody in Canada. And I think that it can be utilized more when our income isn't necessarily going to be tax-free. Now, what do I mean by this tax shelter? Well, I wanna give you a quick example. This is why it's actually important to invest inside of a TFSA instead of just investing inside an open, regular account. Now, 
let's say um, two individuals, if they're, well, actually no, I'm gonna say that what if there was a stock or some kind of investment that gave us 100% growth every single year? That would be pretty amazing, right? It doesn't actually exist, but hey, maybe with inflation going the way it will, maybe, maybe someday it will. But um, let's say two individuals each invest $1 into this account. Now, this $1 is going to be doubling or growing by 100% every single year. And if this growth was tax sheltered, after a year, we would have $2. After uh, two years, then four, then eight, 16, so on and so forth, right? After 21 years inside this account, we would have $1,048,000. Pretty insane, right? Um, if it were me, maybe I would invest $2 just to see what would happen. Now, of course, this is where the growth is tax sheltered. Now, what would happen if the growth was not tax sheltered? Well, let's say that after our money doubles and grows to $2, the government says, whoa, 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 you just made one whole dollar. You have to pay tax on that dollar. And let's say, for example, that the government takes 30% of the growth that we had inside this. Now, instead of $2, we're going to have $1.70. So, Sure, they took 30 cents, but hey, our money's still going to keep doubling, right? So maybe at the end, maybe we'll be left with, I don't know, four, five, six, seven hundred thousand. But actually, here's the thing if we let this happen for another 20 years in a row, we would be left with $40,600, which clearly, I mean, we lost out on over a million dollars. Right? It's absolutely insane when you look at the power of compound growth. It's not that we literally paid a million dollars in taxes. It's just that every time our money tried to grow, the government wouldn't actually allow it. So my point is that absolutely, sure, it's great that we can make this um, tax-free income, but we want to look for ways where we can keep that growth tax-free and keep more money inside our pockets. So obviously, we want to look for this tax shelter growth. Now, once again, within the TFSA, the growth is tax sheltered and we can access that money tax-free in the future as well. So if we have those options within a TFSA, my last and final point here is that our objective with this account, in my opinion, our objective with the TFSA should be all about growth. It should be to grow our money as much as possible, to keep it invested there for, I mean, three, four, five, six, seven, even more, maybe even 40 years if we have that kind of timeline until retirement. Now, why would the objective of our TFSA be growth? Well, I wanna show you once again, I wanna show you two examples here. Let's say two individuals each invest $10,000 into a TFSA. Um, or sorry, yeah, two individuals each invest $10,000. Uh, so essentially, if this one had 2% growth inside one of those bank GICs that I was telling you about, then how much would their growth be? $200. At the end of the year, they, have, they would have $10,200 inside that account. Are you with me? Now, to move forward here, how much tax would they actually be saving on? Well, they would have had $200 of growth. So you know what, maybe they would have saved 30, 40 bucks by having it inside this TFSA. So, hey, that's not bad. Maybe it's a half a tank of gas, maybe a quarter tank of gas, a couple trips to Timmy's, whatever it is, right? Let's say on the other hand that this individual got 20% return. And there are ways based on, you know, track record where we can actually achieve this kind of growth year after year. Again, I regret that I cannot share them uh, specifically with you right now, but I'll be more than happy to, and I'll leave my email in the chat box for anybody who would like to talk further or even learn more about the education. Now to go back to it. Essentially, what would our growth be on this? $2,000, 20% of 10,000. So as you can see, this individual at the end of the year, they're left with 12,000. Now how much tax are they saving on? 
well, to keep it consistent, this could be anywhere from you know, $300 to $400. So not only are they saving on more taxes, but they are also left with more money. So this is why I'm saying that our objective within our TFSA should always be to grow our money as much as possible. And I firmly believe that a TFSA is a very, very good option for any First Nations who is looking to invest their money because great, it's awesome that we can make our money tax-free and have you know houses tax-free and all that good stuff. But I think with our growth, let's keep in that same line of keeping it all tax-free and keep as much growth as possible so that it, we can save up for our own retirement. We can pay into our kids' futures, into our community's futures, into our family's futures. I firmly believe that this capital belongs in the hands of um, Daniel, that's a very good question. Uh, so do TFSAs have an interest in them? Um, sure, yeah, I'll answer that real quick. So there's a couple types of accounts, right? There's a TFSA, RSP, maybe an RESP, RDSP, and a couple others as well. Now, which of these accounts does somebody think would actually give us the most growth? A lot of people might think that, hey, maybe the TFSA gives us the most growth, just because, I mean, I don't know, that's what a lot of people see other people use it. Or maybe the RRSP gives us the most growth because it's been out so long. But I want to say that none of these accounts determine any of the growth whatsoever. Our growth is always determined by the fund or by the investment vehicle that we have inside that account. So if we have a GIC that's doing 2% a year inside our TFSA, then our TFSA is going to be growing by 2% a year. If we have another investment option that's growing by 20% a year, then our TFSA is growing by 20% a year. Hey, we could lose money inside our TFSA and the government is not going to care because none of these accounts, again, guarantee any of that uh, growth at all. So is it feasible for one to reach 20% interest? Daniel, I could say absolutely. I mean, given the track record over the last 10 years of some of these investments, I mean, they can average 15, 18, 21, 22% per year. Now, of course, tr uh, track record is not a guarantee of any future performance, but at the end of the day, I would say that um, essentially, yeah, the growth, the growth is always going to depend on the vehicle that we have inside. Um, and just to kind of, hopefully that answers your question, but just to answer a little further here, let's say that you have, I don't know, Apple stock inside of a TFSA. Well, the only way that any of these accounts are different is the way that the government looks at our money for tax purposes. So let's say you have this Apple uh, stock inside of a TFSA. Then the government's gonna look at all that growth as tax free, uh, tax sheltered growth and tax free withdrawal. Now, let's say that you've held the same exact Apple stock inside an, uh, inside an RRSP. Now, this RRSP, it's the exact same uh, stock, it's the same investment still, it's just looked at the, by the government slightly different for tax purposes. And once again, we have tax sheltered growth, but on the RSP side, it is taxable income when we withdraw it. And um, yeah, essentially it's added onto our income. So the only way that it's looked at is different is just the tax. And that actually finished up a little earlier than I was planning. I was planning to finish up around 245 for any questions, any further questions and answers that I can help people with. And yeah, that's basically all I prepared to share uh, with this for today. Great, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, thank you, Levi. Um, if there aren't any questions, we can just close it up a little bit early. Um, thank you, Levi, for taking the time to 
share with us your knowledge today. Um, an evaluation will be sent out to everybody afterwards. Oh, there's a question from Daniel in the chat. Awesome. Daniel, um, I think that uh, I wouldn't necessarily suggest going to the bank. Um, like, well, simple can be good. I think that, well, there's a lot of different strategies. So it's very, very difficult for me to answer that question. Um, maybe I'll or shoot me an email and I could send you some, you know, of the, of the different strategies. And, you know, unfortunately, like I can't share them in a group setting, but again, anybody who's interested in looking at a little more into these strategies, then I would be happy to talk more with you. Great, thank you again. Um, awesome. And every Tuesday is Links to Learning. Thank you for joining us and hope you have a great afternoon. I'd love to see that too, Kelly. Thank you very much for having me, Elsie. Thank you everyone for attending. And uh, yeah, it was my pleasure.